but we are going to finish up the book of Jonah tonight. Um, Lord willing, obviously, he could all, you know, he could rapture us home, and that would be great. We don't get to finish, and uh, we can ask Jonah in person about some of these things, and that would be kind of cool. Uh, but um, anyway, we're going to be, should things not change, in Jonah 3 and 4 tonight. So let's pray. Father, I do thank you for this book. I thank you, Lord, that this is a book that so many people have uh, read and um, they're familiar with. I thank you, Lord, that this is one of the first books in the Bible I ever remember reading. But, Father, I pray that in our familiarity we would not miss the point. We would not miss your mercies. And we would not hesitate to share those mercies with the world. So, Father... Guide us and teach us tonight through your word. Teach us by your spirit, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I think that perhaps the only uh, size numbers that receive more exaggeration than fish stories, when we talked about fish stories last week, are church attendance figures. And when you, when you go to a pastor's conference, these things tend to get inflated and people get a little bit zealous with the numbers, and it turns from evangelistic fervor to evangelistic stretching, right? I have a friend who's come up with a very creative way of answering the very common question, how big is your church? How many people come to your church? How, how many come? And he says, well, on any given Sunday, we have between two and 3,000 people. <laughs> Absolutely accurate. We have between two, 3,000 somewhere in there, somewhere in between. I love that, yeah, but it keeps the focus where it needs to be. And whatever records are kept by some churches regarding attendance, conversions from outreach, no ministry has ever had the singular success of that of Jonah. He had one outreach to one city. The response rate was 100%. Jonah wasn't even preaching to what you might call an easy crowd, one that was prepped for revival. He was preaching to complete pagans that were happy in their sin. And more than that, Jonah didn't even go in with the idea of wanting to them to repent. He did not want them to repent. But they did, much to the prophet's chagrin. And that set off a whole series of events between God and Jonah, in which Jonah receives a first-hand lesson from the Lord on the nature of true compassion and pity. See, as a prophet of the li living God, Jonah should have done more than just repeat the words of God. He should have reflected, modeled the character of God. And he didn't. Jonah was angry and vindictive, and he went so far as to blame God concerning his goodness. And as we've seen in the first couple of chapters of Jonah, that the pagans acted more godly than the prophet. And that's a problem. Yes, God was merciful towards Nineveh, but he was also merciful towards Jonah None of them deserved God's mercies, but that's exactly why it's called mercy, because it's not deserved. Now, remember what had led up to this point, and this is crucial as we get into the second couple of chapters. In the midst of the rise of the Assyrian Empire, it's really not all that long before um, the northern kingdoms fall to the Assyrians. God called Jonah to go to preach to one of the chief cities, if not the absolute capital of the empire at this time, definitely one of the chief cities of Assyria, to preach a message of judgment to them. Now, it's unusual enough for a prophet of the Lord to be sent to another country. It's not unusual at all for them to have words regarding other countries, but to be sent to another country, very, very unusual. But even more strange to have a prophet sent to a people that would be considered an outright enemy of God's people. And Jonah, very understandably, didn't want to do it. He knew uh, the, the prophecies that were coming that the northern kingdom would fall to Assyria. He did not want to go, and so he rebelled. He fled in the opposite direction. Instead of going approximately 550 miles northeast by land to Nineveh, he hops a boat out of the port of Joppa and sailed due west to the furthest port known to him, which was Tarshish, and probably on the coast of modern-day Spain. He's so consumed by himself at this point, he's so consumed by his rebellion that he's willing to endanger the lives of everybody else with him if it meant that he could avoid going to Nineveh. Now, as he would learn, it's impossible to avoid God forever. You can't run from the God who is everywhere. 
So we saw God's prepared a terrible storm. The sailors are forced to make a choice between their lives and Jonah's, and per Jonah's instructions, they throw him overboard. Of course, the sailors are saved. They experience supernatural calm. Scripture indicates they even came to faith all while Jonah splashing around in the sea. Now, he wasn't afloat long. God prepared this giant fish-like creature. Could be a whale, could be a shark, could be a fish. We don't really know. So all is Jonah has the first recorded submarine ride in history. Prophet gets to shore. He's supernaturally protected within the creature's gullet. He prays a humble prayer of repentance along the way. Three days later, of course, vomited on to land. And that's where we left off, and that's where chapter 2 leaves off, and that's where the story continues. So at this point, the question is, what will Jonah do now? When initially called by God, he ran. This time he would physically obey, but his attitude wouldn't improve. Jonah still hated these people. He still saw them as deserving of God's judgment. He despised the mercy that he was certain that God would give. Now, what Jonah didn't understand was that he was just as undeserving of God's judgment. And it was only due to God's wonderful mercy that he was alive. We don't want to despise the mercy of God. We want to rejoice in his goodness. So let's look at his second chance, starting in verse 1 of chapter 3. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach to it the message that I tell you. So we see God giving Jonah a second chance. When he first spoke to Jonah, Jonah ran. There was no earthly reason for God ever to speak to Jonah again, but he did. In the counsels of God, he had a purpose not just to use Jonah to proclaim his word, but he had a purpose to teach Jonah his character. He wasn't done dealing with the prophet himself. He had more than one purpose for this prophet. He was going to see it done, even if Jonah's kicking and screaming, resistant all along the way. Now, praise God for the mercies that he showed Jonah. Praise God for the mercies he shows us. We just want to be careful not to presume upon those mercies. Just because God sometimes gives us second chances doesn't mean that he always gives us second chances. Now, don't misunderstand me. We always have the opportunity to repent, We always have the opportunity to receive those mercies, those graces of God. But you know what? We might not get the opportunity to relive an opportunity that we missed in the past. Sometimes we have to start anew from wherever we find ourselves, whatever consequences we've received. If you think of it this way, someone that's convicted of a crime, praise God if they come to faith in Jesus in jail, but they're not automatically released upon their conversion to Christ. Sometimes they have to start living for Jesus right from their prison cell. Likewise for us. That said, God does sometimes give second chances. And when he does, treasure them. Don't waste them. When he gives you an opportunity, you want to go for it with all you got. So what was this message that he was called to preach? Now, we'll find that out in verse 4. But for now, please notice the difference between this calling and his initial calling. And I'll put it up there, but you could probably just look over a couple uh, pages, if even that. Jonah 1, verse 2, the initial calling was this, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. So at this time, that time, Jonah was commanded to generally cry out against the city for its wickedness. Now, in chapter 3, Jonah's given a very specific message from the Lord God. Go preach that message that I will tell you. Now, it's quite likely that if Jonah had been obedient the first time, God would have revealed to him a very specific message along the way. But at this time, we know it's explicit. Jonah was to proclaim God's word and nothing but. No commentary from the prophet was wanted, nor was it needed. People still need to know the word of the Lord rather than the thoughts of men. As we talked about on Sunday afternoon, this is one of the reasons why we emphasize verse-by-verse teaching at Calvary Chapel. This is why we place such a high value on the Bible, because it is God's Word that changes lives, not our opinions. If it was Jonah's opinion, nobody in Nineveh would have heard the Word of the Lord. Got to do God's Word. Verse 3, so Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three-day journey in extent. Just to recall, where was Nineveh? Again, 550 miles northeast of where he was um, in in Israel. And Nineveh, there's kind of a close-up of what it might have looked like according to archaeological excavations. How big was it? Well, it was 
pretty big. Scholars, though, are divided over this reference to a, a three-day journey in extent. Because if 20 miles was considered a day's journey, then it seems unlikely that it was 60 miles in circumference. Now, one ancient writer actually does indicate that it was close to that size, but the archaeological excavations that they've done, they've shown a foundations of a large city, but much smaller than 60 miles in circumference. But that said, if we think of this as being the general area surrounding Nineveh, not only that which was in the city walls, but the villages that were in the area that was established as an ancient city, goes back to the days of Genesis, as mentioned by being founded by Nimrod, then that definitely is a possibility that it was that big. Could also be a reference to the total length of the streets and alleyways contained within the city. Jonah would have been walking up and down these things. But whatever the precise reference to this is, the bottom line is clear. This was a big city. And in fact, over and over again, when it says that great city in Jonah, it's not saying that this was a wonderful place to be. No, that's a reference to size, that great city, that huge city. This is no minor village with a small population. This was a major city, even by ancient standards. And in contrast then to what happened earlier, this time Jonah obeyed. It said he did arise, just as God told him to arise. But instead of running, he went to Nineveh. He made his way to the city. Now, his attitude still needed a lot of work, but he at least took the first steps of repentance in actual obedience. Sometimes, and we can't say always because we see this happen with Jonah, but sometimes our attitudes will follow our actions. You know, if we have a difficult time loving someone, we'll start acting loving towards someone. Make an effort to show compassion, and quite often that's when our heart will start to feel compassion along the way. But if you turn that around, if we never act according to repentance, then can we ever say that we've ever really repented? Words are never going to be a substitute for obedience. Now, he needed to get both things right here, but at the very least, he is acting in obedience towards the Lord, and that's, that's at least a start. It doesn't take him all the way, but it is a start. Verse 4, And Jonah began to enter the city on the first day's walk. Then he cried out and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. That's it. That was God's message to Nineveh. Now, was that all? Perhaps not. Uh, perhaps Jonah summarized the message for this writing. Certainly, almost certainly, he proclaimed it more than just a single time when he entered this city, three days that he was going through town. But even given those possibilities, there's not a lot here. This isn't exactly a barn burner of a message, right? In Hebrew, it's just five words. Of course, he was probably speaking in Aramaic to the Assyrians, but even so, five words. And what is recorded, there's no identification of God. There's no mention of even the possibility of grace. All Jonah gives, or at least all that's recorded here, is a message of judgment. The people had 40 days to prepare themselves, and then the whole city would be overthrown, or perhaps better translated, overturned. Life was about to change drastically for the people, and it would only be by the mercies of God, which was totally unidentified and left out by Jonah, that they even had an inkling of this at all. Is there mercy in only the proclamation of judgment? Yes, there is. Let's think about that for a moment. God does not have to warn anyone at all. He could, and he has the right to, judge anyone and everyone on the very first occasion of sin. God is not under any obligation to let anyone wake up tomorrow morning. Those who have sinned, which would be everyone, those who have sinned deserve immediate judgment. But God gives mercy. He allows people the opportunity to wake up. He allows people the opportunity to seek his face and to ask his help for change. And his proclamation of judgment is exactly what awakens us to our need for change. You know, Paul makes the point to the Romans that we wouldn't even know what sin was unless the law had been given. I wouldn't know what coveting was unless the law said, do not covet, Romans 7, 7. God's declaration of judgment is what lets us know that we face his judgment and that, if nothing else, that in itself is mercy. But beyond that, even if God's mercy is not explicitly proclaimed, it is inherently implied. 
Because after all, why warn anyone 40 days prior to destruction unless there is an opportunity for people to avoid death? Obviously, you say, well, the city could be evacuated, but that doesn't really solve the problem. Because he either brings judgment on the whole city together as a congregation, or he lets individual people drop dead and no matter where they disperse. The only reason for so much warning to be given is for people to turn from their evil and to repent. And that was exactly, of course, what the people did. Now, that being said, even though Jonah never spoke of the mercies of God, we should. We've been given a lot more than just five words to proclaim to the world. We've been given the full gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we can and we should let people know the grand mercies and the grace that's available to them in Jesus. Now, do we tell them the law? Absolutely, we do. It brings conviction. But when the time is right, we move from law to grace. It is the goodness of God that leads us to repentance, Romans 2, 4. So we want to let people know of his goodness. So Jonah preached, and Nineveh repented, starting here in verse 5. So the people of Nineveh believed God, proclaimed a fast, put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. The word came to the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne and laid aside his robe, covered himself in sackcloth, and sat down in ashes. How many people responded to this very lackluster message from Jonah? All of them, from the greatest to the least of them, from the king of the city, uh, not necessarily the king of the Assyrian Empire, but the king of the city, the ruler of the city, all the way down to the lowest of servants, every single one of these people came to at least some point of repentance. And that's astounding. You think of evangelists like D.L. Moody and you know Billy Graham, Greg Laurie, you, you name the famous evangelist of choice, as incredible responses as some of them have seen, not a single one has ever seen a 100% response rate. The repentance of Nineveh is the greatest Gentile revival in all human history. Now, whether or not they came to faith in the true God is unsaid. We don't want to presume, but we do know they responded to the message of judgment here and they repented, believing God. And notice that their repentance had two parts. They believed and they acted. Even with as little as Jonah said, they believed God. Different theories have been proposed as to why they believed. Uh, perhaps uh, Jonah was left with scarring and a stench from being left in a fish for three days. And the, the, the people who worshipped a, a god in the shape of a fish, Dagon, would have been in awe by the power of Jonah's god over their fish god. That's one theory. Perhaps they had heard the story of Jonah's revival from the fish, and they put their faith in the God who could raise a man from the dead. Another very good theory. Or perhaps Jonah said absolutely nothing about his story, and it was just a sovereign work of God among the people of Nineveh. But whatever the case, they did believe, and it drastically changed them. And beyond believing in their hearts, they took definitive action. They, they humbled themselves through fasting, through wearing sackcloth. We'll look at more of that in a minute. So internally they believed, externally they took action. And as we've seen so many times, repentance is both internal and external. It's a change of mind and a change of direction. It's a turning from and a turning to. That's exactly what the people of Nineveh did. And apparently it started as a grassroots movement, made it all the way up to the nobles, the, the leader of the city, and the king makes this proclamation saying that if you haven't done it yet, basically, go do it now, right? Verse 7, he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and nobles, saying, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily to God. Yes, let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who can tell if God will turn and relent? and turn away from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. Uh, there's a lot of things going on here. Number one, they proclaimed a fast. They willingly gave up their food in order that they might seek the Lord. One of the great things a fast does is that it reminds you that you're dependent on somebody else for your sustenance, your nourishment, your very life itself. And that's what they did. They proclaimed a fast. Second, they demonstrated humility, and that really goes hand in hand with the fast. You know, like giving up their food, they gave up their comfortable clothing. They gave up all their comforts understanding that their position before God needed to be one of mourning, not celebration. They're not going around with their richest robes. They're going around showing their dependency upon mercy. Third, they're crying out to God in prayer. You know, those first two actions mean nothing without prayer. 
people try to treat fasting like it's some sort of magic way to manipulate God into doing what we want him to do, and that's not the case. It's not a ritual that forces God into action, but they are external indications of an internal attitude. Again, our attitudes were one that's dependent on life for sustenance, for, for strength, for guidance, for mercy, for forgiveness. That's what fasting and the sackcloth did. And they're crying out to God in prayer. They're actually praying, hopefully, to the one true God. We're not given the covenant name of God here at this time, but at least they're crying out to God. The next thing we see is that they instructed the need for repentance. More than just prayer was needed, they understood this. Action was required. The explicit decree of the king was for the people to turn from his evil way and from the violence that's in his hands. So the king and the people were, at least by this point, very aware of their sins, and they understood that it needed to stop. we got to do more than just say something about this. we got to do something about it. Forsake our evil ways. And then lastly here, they held out hope in God, having faith in him. Maybe he'll turn. Maybe he will relent. You know, that's basically the opposite of the proclamation of Jonah. Jonah said 40 days, it'll be overthrown. But this was the desired outcome for the Ninevites. And actually was very reasonable to hope for. Because after all, sincere repentance and mercy is at the very heart of God. We read this and reference it quite often from Ezekiel 33, 11. Say to them, as I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways, for why should you die, O house of Israel? Now, contextually, obviously, this was spoken to the Jews. To them prior to the, um, there was already some Babylonian captivity at this point, but prior to, to further suffering that they would experience. But the principle applies to more than just the Jews. It is far better in God's eyes for people to repent than for him to judge them in his wrath. Now, God will judge. When necessary, he will do so. He will do so swiftly and justly, but he prefers to show grace. He prefers to shower people with mercy and praise God that he does because if God did not desire to show mercy none of us would be saved so they had hope in God that he might do this and guess what God did and God saw verse 10 God saw their works that they turned from their evil way according to this decree here and God relented from the disaster that he said he would bring upon them and he did not do it Nineveh repented God relented God saw their works, and God showed mercy in his response. Nineveh turned from its path, so God turned from his own declaration of judgment against them. The principle here is that God responds to repentance. He responds to repentance. This is his desire for us, is to repent. This is what he explicitly commands us to do. So knowing that, why then would he not respond if we actually did it? People wonder, well, you know, he declared their uh, judgment, so did he really know, you know, predestined what was going to happen and this was always going to be his plan all along? You know, how this all works together in the eternal counsel of God is something that we really cannot definitively answer from this side of eternity. Of course, he knew what was going to happen, but there was still a free will choice in play here. But all we can definitively say is that God commands us to repent, and he responds to people who do so. The problem is that most people don't do so. God gives the opportunity for people to receive mercy. He wants people to respond to his offer of mercy, but you know what? He's not going to force anybody to do it. We're the ones who need to make the choice to repent, but when we do, we find that God is good to his word. He will respond to our repentance. Now, some people have asked this regarding God's response here. Does this make Jonah a false prophet? Forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. But that's not what happened. No, it's not a false prophet for, for Jonah. It is true that Jonah proclaimed certain judgment on the city. But remember, there's an implicit offer of mercy just by the existence of a time window of 40 days. So the promise of judgment is conditional. 
not unconditional and unwavering. If the city had not repented, the wrath of God would have been poured out. As it was, the city responded to God's message to them. He responded in kind according to his mercies. Now, even beyond that, Jonah's word to the city being overturned, remember, not overthrown necessarily, but overturned, that's still true in a manner of speaking. Forty days had not passed before the city was turned upside down in repentance. When the apostles went through the Roman Empire preaching the gospel, these are the people who have turned the world upside down. Well, the same thing happened in Nineveh. These were not the same people as they had been before. They experienced a glorious transformation. Everything had turned over, and that's exactly what God had desired for them. So we'll get into chapter 4 here. Nineveh's gone through all of this. Well, what's Jonah's response to this? First, he's angry. Verses 1 through 4, verse 1 says, But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he became angry. You know, the Hebrew is interesting here. Um, it would be a very wooden word-for-word -word translation, but it, you could say something like this, and it was evil, or it was bad to Jonah, great evil, and he burned with anger. God's goodness was evil in Jonah's sight. That's how backwards things have become. The Gentiles were repenting in faith while the Hebrew prophet was responding with anger, accusing God of evil. That's what selfishness does to us. It consumes us, and we simply cannot see anything else. Verse 2, so he prayed to God and said, Ah, oh Lord, was this not what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore I fled previously to Tarshish, for I know that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. Here's his complaint as he prays. What's his complaint? God, you're too good. Jonah knew the truth about God's character, and God was so good that it displeased him. And what, God, uh, what Jonah rather said about God was basically God's own description of himself. You might remember when he was describing his name, describing his own character to, to Moses uh, way back on Mount Sinai. He, he went through much of the same description, uh, uh, Exodus 34, 6 and 7. The Lord passed before him, passed before Moses, said the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering, abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children of the third and the fourth generation. Now, Jonah's hoping more for the latter part, less of the former. But you know, in actuality, God's nature cannot be so easily divided. His mercy does not exist without his judgment. His wrath is not known apart from his love. And say, well, how can you know that? We know that very definitively by looking at the cross of Jesus. Because at the cross of Jesus, the nature of God is fully revealed. His wrath towards sin must be satisfied by a sufficient death. And his love is demonstrated by the fact that he sent his son to be that sufficient death for us. So although these things might seem impossible to reconcile in God's character, no, it's fully reconciled in Christ. And this is why Jesus is the only way to God. We cannot be saved apart from him because he fulfills God's justice and he fulfills God's love. Now, Jonah understood this, even though, of course, he would have been ignorant about Jesus in many ways. But Jonah understand, he understood that God's mercies are greater than what he could possibly imagine and that if given the opportunity, God would turn from the harm that he otherwise promised to bring. In fact, that word disaster could be translated to harm, could be translated to evil in certain contexts, but that disaster, God would turn from that. Now, without the message of judgment, Nineveh would never have been awakened to their need to repent. Thus, surely, Nineveh would have been destroyed. That was the entire reason Jonah didn't want to go there in the first place. He never wanted his enemies to know the goodness of God. What he desired was their destruction. Is there anybody that you so hated that you wanted to see destroyed? Is there anyone that you believe should never hear the message of the gospel? You would be disappointed if they came to faith in Christ. I was reminded not too long ago about a a story from Corey Ten Boom, where she was uh, speaking on one occasion, and a guard, an SS guard from the camp where she was imprisoned, came up to greet her afterwards. She recognized him immediately, and he knew who she was, but he didn't know if she would recognize him at all. 
and he gave the testimony that he had actually come to faith in Christ and he was asking for her forgiveness. And she said she hesitated for a moment. She forced herself to stretch out her hand and say, I forgive you. And of course, the, the love of God came pouring over her at that, that instant. But you would think that if anybody would have the right to say, well, I want that person to be destroyed, it would have been somebody stuck in, a, in prison in a Nazi concentration camp. But that's not the truth, is it? Even those people need to hear the gospel, they need to be saved. Even our worst enemies, the, the terrorists who want to see us dead, the terrorists who want to blow up buildings and kill women, kill children, even they need to hear the gospel and they need to be saved. Nobody's so vile that we would wish them an eternity in hell. But that's where Jonah found himself, and that's a very dangerous place to be. Verse 3, Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Then the Lord said, Is it right for you to be angry? Okay, so this is how much he hated the Assyrians. He would have preferred himself to die than for his enemies to experience the, the judgment of God. It's one of the reasons he didn't really have a problem being thrown overboard in the Mediterranean Sea. He would have rather drowned in the Mediterranean than to live to see the day that Nineveh escaped judgment. And that's, of course, when God asked him this very probing question, one that he's going to come back to later on. Was Jonah right in his anger? In other words, was this morally, ethically correct for a supposed man of God? Now, we think that answer should be obvious. It should have been a rhetorical question. Though, as we'll see, there was nothing obvious to Jonah about it. But before we get to the lesson, stop to consider the irony of all of this for a moment. Because, yes, Nineveh had been spared the judgment of God, and that was infuriating to Jonah. But how was it that they were spared? Well, because they had had a message proclaimed to them by a prophet who himself had been spared the judgment of God. Did Nineveh deserve destruction? Yes, but so did Jonah. The moment Jonah disobeyed God, he deserved to die. Yet God allowed him to live while on the boat. God allowed him to live the moment he was cast overboard. God allowed him to live when swallowed by a giant fish. God allowed him to live when he was spit up on the shore. God even gave Jonah a second chance at preaching his word. And even after all of that, Jonah still objects at the fact that God allowed an entire city to live and have a second chance of living apart from evil. For a prophet of the living God, Jonah was a hypocrite of the highest proportions. Knowing that we ourselves are the recipients of God's mercy and grace, how can we possibly deny it to others? Now, along those lines, it might behoove us to think, how could we possibly refrain from sharing it with others? Because again, it's something that we've received as a gift. So Jonah gets his object lesson starting here in verse 5 with a plant. So Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city. There he made himself a shelter and sat under it in the shade till he might see what would become of the city. And uh, some have uh, wondered or posited rather that this might have been a flashback during that 40 years time or 40 days time to see what might happen to the city. Uh, maybe this did happen after God already said he would relent. Um, don't really know the time frame here, but he did hold out hope at this point for judgment. Perhaps he's singing that God's going to rain down fire and brimstone like in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. He's picking out a prime spot for viewing the whole thing. He's waiting for it to come to pass. Obviously, he's going to be waiting a while. And so the lesson begins in verse 6. And the Lord God prepared a plant and made it come up over Jonah that it might be shade for his head to deliver him from his misery. So Jonah was very grateful for the plant. But as morning dawned the next day, God prepared a worm and it so damaged the plant that it withered. And it happened when the sun arose that God prepared a vehement east wind. And the sun beat on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. And then he wished death for himself and said, It is better for me to die than to live. Now, you might notice that repeated word prepared. It's the same word that was used in reference to the great fish in, Roman, or in Jonah chapter 1, verse 17. God had prepared, ordained, appointed, all kinds of things for this moment. He prepared a plant. He prepared a worm. He prepared a wind. All of these things were done by the sovereign will of God. Now, Jonah was grateful for the plant. Not so much for the worm. Downright hated the wind. 
All the comfort that he had experienced from the previous day was gone. He's now baking under the hot desert sun, being blasted by this wind from the east. He's like he's in a furnace. He's totally miserable and ever prone to exaggeration. Our friend Jonah thought it was better to die than to live. Now, keep in mind, he'd only been in this place barely 24 hours, and already he's wishing for death. And just underscores how self-centered he had become by this point. From a literary standpoint, He's become a ridiculous figure. He's almost comic relief now, which again is a pretty sad position for a prophet of God to be. That being said, it's really difficult for us to point with too many fingers at him because how many times do we start whining when things don't go our way? God, it's not fair. I don't want this. But this is what God has prepared. Are we going to submit ourselves to God? Verse 9, then God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plan? And he said, it is right for me to be angry even to death. So God asked the same question about the plan as he had about his mercies. And this time, Jonah responds, said, yes, it was morally right for him to be angry. He believed that he had every reason to complain about the death of the plant, even though the plant had been an obvious gift of God's grace, one that Jonah freely acknowledged came from the Lord. He was grateful for the plant. If the plant had been there, Jonah thought, I would have been completely sheltered from the sun and from the wind. And Jonah knew that just as surely God had provided the plant, God had also provided the worm and the wind. So in essence, Jonah isn't angry about the plant. Jonah is angry with God. He was upset that God would choose to remove a blessing from his life, even if it was a blessing he did not deserve, nor even a blessing that he requested just God had given it to him. He had built a lean-to shelter. God just gave him more. Jonah was upset at God's sovereignty. He was upset at the application of God's mercy. He was upset that God was God and that he was not. Now, if we're honest with ourselves, isn't this the main reason we find ourselves upset with the Lord? When God chooses to act in a certain way, we wanted him to do something else. And so like a child throwing a temper tantrum, we throw a tantrum with the Lord. Never mind that the Lord has been nothing but gracious with us. Never mind that he showered us with mercies, that he's made us his children. Never mind that we have the seal of the Holy Spirit within us. We're guaranteed an eternal future with Jesus. We didn't get our way, so we're upset. We think we know better than God and that he should have done things the way that we wanted him to do. Oh man, we are so foolish. We're also so dependent upon the grace of Jesus because if it was not for his ongoing mercies towards us, none of us would be saved. Never forget that God is always good. Never forget that God is always right. He knows the end from the beginning and he knows what fits best with his counsel and his eternal plans. God is God, we're not. We need to trust him. He knows what he's doing. And that's really the point that he drives home here in verse 10, 11, the moral of the story, we might say. But the Lord said, you have had pity on the plant for which you have not labored, nor made it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city, in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right hand and their left, and much livestock. So he points out the selfishness, the foolishness of the prophet. Jonah had more pity on a withered plant than he did on a city full of ignorant people. The plant lasted less than a day, yet God had known all the individual Ninevites since before the foundation of the world. And so many people in that city were desperately lost. They knew nothing of God apart from what Jonah had revealed to them, which was basically nothing. They were so spiritually ignorant that it was as if they didn't know the difference between their right and left hands. Now, a lot of scholars believe this is a reference to young children in the city. If that's the case, the number seems a little excessive. But either way, the picture is one of ignorance. There were a whole bunch of people there that were doomed to destruction. Where's Jonah's love? Where's his compassion? Where's his pity? Where's his mercy? If he had so much care for a single plant, why didn't he at least care about the animals in Nineveh? At the very least, should have considered all the death of all the livestock, but he didn't. He, again, so consumed with himself and his selfishness, prophet demonstrates none of the character of God. That's not the way it's supposed to be. As God's people, we're supposed to be his representatives. We are his ambassadors to this world. We are the ambassadors of this ministry of reconciliation. We share the love of Christ. People know who we are by our love for one another. 
They know who we are by the things that we do, whether or not we reflect the Lord who saved us. We ought to care about the things that God cares about. We ought to show mercy the way God shows mercy. And of course, at this point, the book ends. The narrative leaves off with Jonah being chastised by the Lord God in the middle of the Assyrian desert outside the city of Nineveh. Of course, the last words that we heard Jonah speak were words of selfishness. There's no sign of repentance. There's no wrap-up. There's no happy ending. At least there, are none, there was none that was written. As I mentioned last week, the, the fact that this book exists at all is evidence that Jonah lived to tell a story, if not write it down himself. And in all likelihood, I believe that he is the author of this book. He did write it down. No one else could have written the prayer the way he did for when he was in the middle of the fish with that kind of detail. So we know this much. Something happened in the life of Jonah after this encounter with the Lord. And the evidence points to a sincere change of heart for the prophet. He doesn't write any more to the story because God did not tell him to write anymore. But what he wrote is refreshingly honest. He never attempts to whitewash his attitude. He doesn't attempt to make himself look better than he was. He shows himself in all of his selfishness and his sin. And you know, he gives a great example to the rest of us of what not to do. So guys, we want to be like Jonah in who he apparently became, not who he was at the time. Don't get upset at the goodness of God. Rejoice in the goodness of God. God's mercies are incredible. and They go out to people who don't deserve them at all. We ourselves are proof. We didn't deserve God's love and grace, but we got it. We didn't deserve the sacrifice of Jesus, but he gave himself for us. And if we can be saved, anyone can be saved. They just need to be told they can be saved. So go tell them. Don't hold back the good news of Jesus Christ from anyone because even the least likely of people still have the opportunity to repent. They still have the opportunity to come to faith in Christ. So we want to be those who give them that opportunity. Of course, that opportunity is repentance. God responds to repentance. When an entire city demonstrated sincere repentance, God relented from his judgment and they were saved. Now, Sad to say, that wouldn't be a lesson that Nineveh would remember past this initial generation. In fact, we're going to read in just a a few weeks the book of Nahum, which speaks of Nineveh's confirmed judgment and destruction. But it's a lesson that we shouldn't forget. When God gives us the opportunity to repent, we've got to take it. We've got to stay in it. Uh, Maybe there's something God's revealed in your life tonight that you need to turn from. Well, you need to do that. Maybe tonight's a night where you need to reaffirm your trust in God. Yeah, God, you are good. You know what you're doing. I don't. I trust you tonight. Well, do that as well. You can do it as we pray. Father, thank you so much for your mercy and your love, not only that you showed towards Nineveh, but that you showed towards Jonah. Nineveh was the city full of evil people that needed to repent from their violent ways towards others, but Jonah had a heart that was hard. Thank you, Lord, for not giving up on Jonah, for continuing to reach out to him, giving him the opportunity to repent and truly humble himself before you. Lord, we look forward to to meeting him in heaven one day. For us, Lord, thank you for continually reaching out to us. And I pray that as opportunities to repent are brought to mind, as you reveal wicked ways in our hearts, that we would confess those things to you immediately and respond obediently. Help us, Lord, live lives of humble repentance grateful for the mercy that you've given us and grateful for the mercy that's available to all the world. Help us go show that mercy, demonstrate it, and proclaim it. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.